All right, my friends. I just pressed the Let's Go Live button. It's a beautiful Friday, and so let's wait for the tubes to connect themselves all across the fruited plain of the interwebs. Before we go ahead and get started, the week's not over yet. We got some prial, prial trep. Ah, oh, gosh, is it going to be a Joe Biden Friday? We got some trial prep to attend to. As soon as the tubes connect themselves, and we got slides today, and so I've got an extra set of discombobulation going on today. Where the heck did those go? Oh, yes, there they are. The tubes are connected. That's tremendous. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and do it, shall we? In one quick second, as soon as that is there, and that's over here. Perfect. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. We've got trial starting very soon, and so we're going to talk about it as soon as I get this pulled up. We're talking about Stormy Daniels. Michael Cohen and other witnesses, and we're going to be unpacking what their backgrounds look like and how we got here. These are key witnesses for Alvin Bragg. Of course, this is the so-called hush money trial. We call it the Stormy Cohen scandal, and we're going to go through it. I got a bunch of stuff that will help us get an overview because this has been going on since 2017. It's been, you know, a lot of uh, prosecutions, then non-prosecutions. Then we're going to start prosecuting again and so on and so forth. And now we are going there, right? We're starting on Monday unless something happens, lightning bolts from the Supreme Court or something, then jury selection is going to be starting. And so we're going to get up to speed on exactly what's happening and really kind of cram together, you know, like almost a decade of stuff into just a short bit of time so we know who we're going to hear from. They are preparing security there, Secret Service is ready to go. FBI's ready to go. And so we'll see what their statements are on all of this. And then yesterday, we had a theory that they were going to start screaming that this hush money case was not really about hush money anymore. It was really more about you know election interference because nobody really cared about hush money. Everybody's going, wait a minute, wait a minute. When is this from? 2017? Like, what? I remember those good old days. They're like, yeah, I remember those good old days back when like we didn't have multiple wars going on in a, in a total c- catastrophic border to th- 2017 and 18, you know, when Trump was in charge. So uh, they're starting to have a change in their narrative where they're shifting now to it's not about hush money. It's about election interference. And this is Lanny Davis. He's a legal advisor for Michael Cohen. And he's out there on the media saying, hey, when people like us here, when people like, you know, Robin watching the watchers and, you know, everybody out here starts castigating us, mocking us for this ridiculous case with our lying, perjuring witnesses. Well, you tell them that it's about election interference and maybe they'll can take those words and, you know, cram it or whatever he's going to tell us. So we'll listen to that. We got a couple other clips in reaction to this trial, right? This is kind of like attorneys all around the country who are following this case are all like, getting a little nervous because it's trial on Monday, you know, that trial feeling. I mean, maybe, I don't know, I am. I don't know if they are, but I can tell you I am. I'm like, oh, we've got trial on Monday. I'm like, I got to get my slides done. I'm like, you're not going to trial. Hello. I'm like, we kind of are. We kind of are going to trial. So I better get my freaking slides done, you know? All right. So closing arguments, opening arguments, we're ready to go, man. So hopefully you're getting geared up for it too. Jonathan Turley was up on uh, the media having conversations with them about it. And he has an idea about what might give Trump an advantage. Napolitano's out talking about no cameras in the courtroom, saying what a travesty this is, how ridiculous it is that we don't even get to see this. And it's not just that there's no cameras, right? I mean, this thing is locked down. Even the public docket, right? You can't even access the filings. It's ridiculous. Even the appeals, like the whole state is locked down. It's just a joke. And so we'll hear from him. And then Greg Jarrett, again, he's talking about how this is just a political prosecution. And then, of course, My friends, we're going to hear from you and see what you have to say about all this. As soon as we are done going through our PowerPoint deck and some other things. And so we're grateful you are here and with us. I hope you had an incredible week. Hopefully your to-do list is just done. You're just like, you know, 
I have nothing to do. So how about we just sit back, put our feet up and enjoy the show. That's what I'm endeavoring that is happening for you. But if not, if you're finishing it up, well, we'll see you soon when you're done. But hopefully it was a very successful week. I'm sure it was. We had a great members only stream this morning where we jump off, start our days off, get our, our bearings straight on what's happening in the world around us. We do that at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And this morning, apparently, uh, there is a World War III imminent Marco Rubio, who's kind of a strange prognosticator. You know, he's kind of had some weird uh, foresight in some global international affairs. And so he was saying, like, any day now, any minute now, Iran versus Israel. So that should be uh, problematic for all of us. And we also talked about uh, Joe Biden meandering around and... What was the other story? Oh, FISA, man. That was a wild stream this morning. We were like watching it live as the, the horse race was going on. It was like 212, 213, no, 213 to 212, no, 208. It was like, it was like crazy. We watched it live and then at the very last minute, it was tied 212 to 212. And so that was the amendment to make a warrant requirement. And of course that failed. And so FISA passed. Eat it, America. You're welcome. Enjoy your safe country free from terrorists you're welcome you're like i can't even walk to my car at night are you kidding me okay spy on me okay so all right that's the fbi and our, our deep state in action we talked about all that this morning wild it was wild morning actually it was like one of those things you just tune in live you know like let's just go see what congress is up to like hit it at the right moment and the whole thing exploded it was just wild we also have robertgovea.com where we have our pdfs our show notes our daily newsletter, our merch store, our calendar. Sometimes people are upset about notifications. I know the apps, the platforms get all wonky on us, but you can go to robertgovea.com, add the calendar like to your calendar. And so when there is stuff happening, like if we have to make a show adjustment, which we haven't, haven't had, had to be doing uh, lately, but we might, that's where you can add it to your calendar, get notifications for the show event, member streams and all the things. We also have Watcher Lodge. Tomorrow, my friends, come on over to watcherlodge.com. We we're having a lot of fun over there. We got some cool stuff cooking and I got some fun posts over there. If you're interested in some home gardening a little bit, I got two posts up now and we're going through the journey. So <laughs> we're having fun. Oh, and I'm gonna be unboxing something on Saturday. So that's garden day one we shared yesterday. This is day two, it's coming up soon. So go check it out, go watch it. And then this is what we're gonna be unboxing tomorrow. If you've ordered from this company before, then you might recognize the packaging, but it's fun, it's fun, it's a lot of fun. So we'll open it up. I mean, it's nothing, any like what's inside is not very exciting, but how it is sent is what's fun. So come check that out, watcherlodge.com. We'll talk, we talk sovereignty and self-development, and we would love to have you come and join us. It's all free, and it's to help us talk about solutions to a lot of the problems in the world. So that we can be anti-fragile and stronger when the, all of this comes crashing down. All right, my friends, now, without any further ado, let's jump in to the day's activities and get our slides queued up because we have to get into business now. And hopefully the animations are on point today. We'll see. Let's get to it. The Stormy Cohen scandal, the prosecution by Alvin Bragg is starting very soon with jury selection brought against Trump in the state of New York. We know Judge Juan Mercan is presiding and we're here on part two of our trial prep to make sure we understand what is happening with these witnesses. Who are these people? How did we get here? And the two big, big witnesses. Remember, this is the so-called hush money case involving Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. So we've got today a deep dive which you gotta use that word carefully here when we're talking about Cohen and Stormy, but we're going through these two witnesses as well as other witnesses in the Alvin Bragg prosecution. Others like Hope Hicks, Trump's former press secretary, Madeline Westerhouse. We've got Karen McDougal, David Pecker, others, maybe even Michael Avenatti will be called as a witness. And so what is the background on these people? Who are they? What's the story behind them? How did we get here? Because remember, this goes all the way back to 2016 and 17. Trump was winning, became the president, and there were stories allegedly that were sold that were cleaning up loose ends. And the main crux of these charges are about payments between Donald Trump to Michael Cohen, and then from Michael Cohen's fake LLCs, he was paying out to Stormy Daniels. But that was just kind of one part of the whole inquiry. There was another story where there was another woman whose name was Karen McDougal, who we're gonna talk about. 
and she had another claim against Donald Trump, but that didn't go through Michael Cohen, and it, it and, well, kind of did, allegedly, but it didn't involve only Michael Cohen. It went through another guy called David Pecker. So David Pecker is the former CEO, he's this guy, of a company called AMI. And AMI, you may remember AMI, they had a bunch of magazines. One of them was called the National Enquirer. And so you would go to grocery stores, newspaper stands, and see these tabloids around where they would say, oh my gosh, Donald Trump was seen with so-and-so or whatever, and it would be celebrity gossip. So he owned one of those companies, and a big one is called National Enquirer. So they would get a bunch of stories. It's called America Media Incorporated. And so apparently, story goes, he met with somebody, he met with Cohen and Donald Trump, and because he had these tabloids, people would come to him and shop stories. So they would say to him, hey, I've got this scandalous story about Donald Trump. Would you like to, to know it? And then he buys those stories. And so he was the CEO of AMI up until 2020, then he's out of there. He started a catch and kill program, okay? So they would be out there kind of shopping for stories, and then those stories would pop up and then they would pay to make them go away. Now, Michael Cohen is the person who says that they worked together. Remember, they also raided Michael Cohen, got a warrant, searched a bunch of his stuff, and then said that he you know, had emails, communications with these people and so on. And so that was background on David Pecker. Now, he was ultimately sued by Karen McDougal, who we're gonna learn more about here in a minute, and she's the woman with that separate claim. And then he was also subpoenaed by the feds, right? The, the federal government, the Southern District of New York, talked about this in part one with Jeffrey Berman. They also investigated Trump. And so he went, they spoke to him. Hey, what was going on here? Were these, you know, what was going on? Because they were saying that these were basically campaign contributions that were illegitimate, that they were, you know, Trump was getting a benefit in having these stories buried and there was money being exchanged over the amount of what a benefit is that somebody could provide by making stories go away. So this guy was subpoenaed by the feds and this is just a quick shot of what the National Enquirer looks like. This is an actual cover story. Inside Trump's nuclear showdown, under seas with IBMs aimed at America, right? And there's pictures of Trump and David Pecker standing there, you know, kind of, hey, we're chummy together and so on. And so he might be a witness, right? We don't know. He, they might bring him in, not necessarily because these charges relate to anything in the indictment, but because they might show a, a scheme, a conspiracy, you know, a pattern of conduct here, and that Trump was in a pattern of trying to go, you know, essentially buy and cover up these stories and make them go away. And uh, we'll see what, how he testifies if he does get called and how that unfolds. Now, the other counterpart to this whole saga is this woman. This is Karen McDougal. She, her background, 1997, was December Playmate of the Month. Hmm. So, some time ago, she was on magazine covers. Now, there was allegedly a nine-month affair with Trump from 2006 to 2007 while she was married with Melania. Trump was married with Melania during that time. She said nine months, and she wrote about it in some memoirs. And so what ended up happening was... AMI, David Pecker, the guy we just heard from, and the National Enquirer, they paid her $150,000 for rights to that story. And this was all happening right around the election. Everybody pops up with their stories. So AMI says, hey, we'll pay you for that, for the rights to the story. And then it kind of uh, went away from there. I mean, she, she ended up, you know, she did interviews and stuff like that, but it didn't uh, metamorphosize into something like Stormy did. So she also... The main allegation, as we talked about, is they, they funded a catch and kill operation. And then here is just the, the top portion of the Playboy Playmate of the Year, just for uh, the slide, just, you know, for posterity. We have next Madeline Westerhout. Now, how a lot of people are saying that she might be the gatekeeper for Trump, right, for a long time. 2017 to 2019, she was the personal secretary to the former president. And at the time, he was the president, so she was there, right? Kind of just keeping uh, people at arm's length from him for a while. And she has a little bit of a tragic outcome, but they reconcile. But from February to August of 2019, she gets a promotion, right? She goes from personal secretary to Trump to director of 
Oval Office operations from February to August 2019. Something happens. She goes out. She's at, you know, an event, a dinner, something like this. And at dinner, she kind of has a couple things to say about the Trump family and in particular about Tiffany Trump. And so we'll say, take a quick look at that. But she was fired. They said, all right, can't have that happening, obviously. So you got to go. Madeline is shown the door, but they did reconcile afterwards. And many people are now saying, okay, she was considered Trump's gatekeeper. So is she going to be subpoenaed to come in and testify? And if so, what does she know? And... How does that implicate Trump? Because if she is the gatekeeper, she may have been privy to these transactions, right? Trump is sort of notorious for not using technology, right? You've seen uh, photos of his office. They kind of bring him clippings and stuff. They bring him newspapers and filings. And so he's reading stuff kind of in clippings. So he's not texting. He's not emailing. And he signs the checks, and if I recall reading, uh, he likes to review basically every check. Like I, I, I don't, I think it might be every check. I'm not sure if it's every check or uh, over a certain threshold. It might be every, but he, you know, he signs everything, and so people bring them to him. And so the question is, who is getting those before they physically bring them to him? You know, what is, what's the process? And the idea is, it's probably this woman. So they're gonna say, well. When you generated the check, when you were receiving the invoice, opening the mail, it, you know, it, putting it in the spreadsheet ledger, whatever you were doing, put it into QuickBooks, whatever, you know, what was this for? What was the conversation about it? How did it all unfold? So Trump's gatekeeper. Now here's the background on the firing. So the reason why I talk about the firing is because we're asking, okay, is this woman going to come out? Is she going to be loyal to Trump? Is she going to be a favorable witness? Is she going to be a disfavorable witness? Somebody who is not on the defense side. Well, there was a falling out at some point. Apparently she was fired. And so how'd it go? Well, here's the story. You know, come on. We've all said something a little bit loosey goosey sometime somewhere. Here's the background. Not that big of a deal. August 30th, 2019, there were some comments from Madeline and she said the following. She left her White House job suddenly back in 2019, you see August, suddenly on Thursday is President Trump's personal assistant, right? Because, uh-oh, why is his personal assistant running out of here? Was fired after bragging to reporters that she had a better relationship with Trump than his own daughters did, Ivanka and Tiffany and that the president did not like being in pictures with Tiffany because she perceived her as overweight, because Trump perceived her as overweight, and a little too heavy for him, you know? Well, it's an interesting article. If you read the full article, it turns out, you know, a little too much to drink that night. You know, people get a little bit inebriated, start popping off at the mouth. We've all been there. And she's very young. She's, you know, a younger person in this position. And so we all get a little bit loose at the mouth. But Trump... The gentleman that he is, he understood this. No big problem at all. I mean, we can't obviously have you around doing that. So we have to uh, split, split. But Trump said, look, hey, I, yeah, we love Madeline. Okay, we still love her. No big deal. He says, while Madeline has a fully enforceable confidentiality agreement, she's a very good person. Okay. And I don't think there would ever be a reason to use it. Okay. She called me yesterday to apologize and had a bad night, okay? We've all had a bad night, you know. Some, and you still, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, I can't believe I said that. Yeah, I can't believe it. Anyone else have one of those or a couple? So had a bad night, Trump, uh, no big deal, I understand. I fully understood and I forgave her, it happens. I love Tiffany, doing great. She's not that fat at all, okay? We'll take a picture sometime soon. Okay, so that's her, right? Question is, wh where is she gonna fall if she does get called in as a witness in the trial? Time will tell. Next, we have Hope Hicks. Hope Hicks, you may remember, she was very involved in the 2016 campaign from 2015 to 2016. She was Trump's campaign secretary for a bit, and then she went to become the White House communications director. Now, this was just for a bit, a brief period of time from 2018 to 2020, she went over to Fox News. She was the chief comms officer over there. 
And then in February of 2020, she became an aide to Jared Kushner. Okay, so she's at the White House. She leaves for about two years, goes and kills it over at Fox, comes back, becomes an aide to Jared Kushner, and then she's back in the White House. Now, that's COVID season, right? Like COVID's just flashing back up. And so the story is, we can't confirm this or not, but the story is she probably gave Trump the COVID, right? She was traveling around with him. She was kind of the first one. Remember when we were all being ridiculous, we were like, let's backtrace it to the origin source human. Remember whatever that was. Where'd it come from? It's probably Hope Hicks infecting our president. Thanks, Hope. <laughs> hey, it kind of worked out. He, he, he survived. Remember, he can't have breathing. <sighs> let's go, America. Well, it was already rigged beyond control at that moment. So we got questions about this because she was very involved in this. Now, call logs apparently have her implicated in this. Some call logs show communications with Michael Cohen, right, around the time all these transactions took place. So is she going to be called? If so, what do those communications look like? And these are questions that really apply to all these witnesses we've talked about thus far. Is Did she know about the Cohen payments? What did she know about them? Because Cohen, as we're going to get to in a minute, was saying that these were all his. These were his payments. These were personal payments. Trump knew nothing about them before he got flipped by the Democrats. And so we'll go through that. But did she know? What did she know? Same question goes to everybody, right? Goes Because these are about falsifying business records. All right, well, what did they know? And how did they falsify them? All right, so she's involved. Was she involved in the discussions? And do Michael Cohen's search warrants, they went and they raided his place. They got a bunch of documents. Do they implicate her? Do they corroborate each other? Do they not corroborate each other? Right, what's the backstory? So that is Hope Hicks. And those are some of the ancillary witnesses who will probably be pretty key witnesses for explaining the chain of causation, the chain of custody, where the checks came from and how they all, you know, ordinarily come through. Explanatory witnesses. So it'll be curious to see. Those are uh, the, the other minor witnesses now. The star of the Bragg prosecution is going to be Michael Cohen. And it's curious that he's going to be the star of this prosecution, given the fact that he is a convicted felon and has already been found guilty of lying to Congress. So they bring a liar back into court. And this is after he's already been accused of lying again, not long ago, when he was the star witness in the Letitia James prosecution, which resulted in nearly a half a billion dollars in an order against Donald Trump. So who is Michael Cohen? We know a lot about him. We've seen him around here before. He is former Trump attorney. He is somebody who in February of 2018 said to the New York Times that this payment to Stormy was used from his personal money, right? And we're gonna go through that article here in a minute. So we're going to recap basically why this should never have been brought and why this witness is terrible and why Alvin Bragg is manufacturing a prosecution, why it's not legitimate. So this is Cohen. In 2018, he said he used his personal money. We're going to recap that story. He also then suddenly something weird happened in February and in January, Stormy supported him and Stormy said, yeah, no, we, I didn't you know, have anything to do with Trump. No affair. Leave me alone. But something happened, okay? August 2018, he flips. Suddenly, the feds get a hold of him. Trump's the president, but you know it's still the DOJ. They are who they are, and they were the ones going after Trump the entire time he was president. So then he pleads guilty to tax fraud, bank fraud, campaign finance violations, and he totally flips. He says, yeah, I, I did manipulate these monies, and I did it on behalf of a, of a campaign, of, of a person running for president or a you know, person in a political campaign. Okay, then he turns around and pleads guilty again. Now, this is a curious one, 2018, right? We have to go all the way back to this. He was pleaded, pleaded guilty to lying to Congress for this Trump Moscow debacle. Now, this is curious. We'll talk about this, break that down as well. So this guy's got two guilty pleas and one of them is for lying to Congress. I have a little bit of a clip on that one as well. He was sentenced to three years prison. I don't know how much time he did on that exactly. February, 2019, he was disbarred in New York. He was Letitia James's star witness, literally like the case, I don't think could have happened without him. And now he's Bragg's star witness. And we'll recall 
that he was alleged by a federal judge. Okay, a federal judge came out and said he lied again in court from his testimony, and he's still going to be brought out to testify. It's insane. So who is Michael Cohen? And we go all the way back to this original statement. What happened in February 2018? And this, I, I think, should eliminate this case. If you have a, a reasonable prosecutor, right, they would say, okay, obviously this is not going anywhere. Cohen comes out February 13th, Maggie Haberman, you've heard her name, February 2018, Michael Cohen comes out, New York Times, he says, Cohen's lawyer says he paid Stormy Daniels out of his own pocket. Trump's longtime personal lawyer years ago said on Tuesday, yeah, he paid the 130 grand out of his own pocket to Stormy who once had claimed to have an affair with Trump. Now, in the most detailed explanation of the payment yet, Cohen, who worked as counsel for Trump for more than a decade, said he was not reimbursed by Trump, not reimbursed by the campaign. Hmm. Neither the Trump org nor the Trump campaign was a party to the transaction with Ms. Clifford, and neither reimbursed me for the payment, either directly or indirectly. Now, you'll say, okay, well, what are the checks for? You know, what are all those? Well, it's Cohen. He's doing a bunch of stuff, right? He's doing a bunch of stuff for Trump, handling a bunch of stuff. So, tr so Trump is just dumping money to him. Now, Cohen said in a statement to the Times, now the payment to Miss Clifford, this is Cohen speaking, the payment to Miss Clifford was lawful and he's Trump's lawyer and was not a campaign contribution or a campaign expenditure by anyone. Now, he declined to answer several follow-up questions, including whether Trump had been made aware that Cohen made the payment why he made the payment, whether he made similar payments to other people over the years and so on. But that's his statement, right? So then suddenly he has to reverse himself. So that's 2018. We know just a bit later, he ultimately then is now pleading guilty. Okay, so the DOJ gets a hold of him. They say, oh, nobody, we're going after Trump. So they start indicting him. So they say, oh, okay. So if Trump's not guilty, guess what? You're guilty. And the DOJ is corrupt. So, you know, let's be fair to Michael Cohen here. He is getting, you know, hatchet jobbed by the DOJ. They're charging him with all these crimes. Oh, you're going to protect Trump? How about this? How about we prosecute you? And then this happens all the time in America. If you comply with us, if you agree to this plea deal, guess what we'll do? We will not send you to prison for the rest of your life, right? You can go to prison for three years and agree to these charges and agree to help us against Trump or... You're looking at 20 years, dude. All the, wait a minute. So you, so you're saying you, you want 34 felonies that are campaign finance violations for every one of those bills, All right? And they hit him with every one, bop, 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 bop. You better do this or else. He goes, are you kidding me? Yes, sir. No, sir. You tell me what to say. And so he takes the, the plea deal, right? This is the back room. This is happening all behind closed doors. Boom. Michael Cohen comes out. He says, holy crap. I didn't know I can go to prison for 150 years. He says, no, no, no problem. I'll take a plea deal. I'll say whatever the hell you want. Michael Cohen pleads guilty Manhattan federal court to eight counts, including criminal tax evasion. All of this was for unreported income, blah, blah, blah. It's the Stormy Daniels and the Karen McDougal money. We'll get to Stormy in a minute. So he flips, right? He flips immediately. So then now we fast forward a little bit further. Now we're going to have to fill in the gaps on this a bit because this goes all the way back. So this was a plea deal that came after the fact in 2018, November 29th. And this is the one that he is lying to Congress. Okay, this is the perjury charge that we reference. He's false testimony to Congress. And you might be thinking that the false testimony that he gave to Congress was to be adverse to Trump, right? Like he's, he is harming Trump. He goes to Congress. He lies about Trump. No, they're mad that he didn't implicate Trump enough. And so they charged him with the crime for not hitting Trump hard enough. And then he pled guilty to that. And what, so what am I talking about? Well, here is from his plea documents. Here is what they're charging. They say on or about August 28th. So again, before Cohen flips. So back before 2018, 2018, he's still saying, I took care of all this. In August 2017, before that, Cohen, this is the charge, he caused a two-page letter to be sent on his behalf to the Select Senate Committee Intelligence, to the House, and to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, right, the two intelligence groups. 
So the letter addressed his efforts at the company by Cohen to pursue a branded property in Moscow. So Cohen says, hey, I've got some information on Moscow. Remember, Trump wins in January. He takes office 2017. Democrats are crying foul about Russia because they're just whacked out. They made up the whole Russia scandal, right? So they're searching Trump, Russia, everything. So Cohen sends a letter into the select committees saying, okay, here's what I know about Russia. Cohen stated for the purpose of the letter that it was to provide the committee with additional information regarding the proposal and referring to the Moscow project, right? This is the Trump Tower in Moscow. Now in the letter to the select committees, Cohen knowingly and deliberately made the false representations. Now they just they, they hit you with nonsense. He, Cause Cohen wrote in the letter, they said, well, what's going on with Trump Russia? So he sends a letter in 2017, he's still on team Trump. He says, well, the project ended in January, 2016 and it was not discussed extensively with others in the company. So Cohen says like Trump Russia wasn't even that big of a deal. He sends a letter. Cohen told us in Congress, they said, Cohen never agreed to travel to Russia in connection with the Moscow project and never considered, right? He told us this, that he never considered talking to individual one, which is probably Trump uh, for the project, right? So Cohen wrote, I primarily communicate with Moscow based development company owners. So Cohen puts this in there. And then three, Cohen did not recall any government response to or contact about Moscow. So Cohen says, well, I don't remember anything about them. And they say, you're a liar, Michael. And they charge him through, right? They charge him with this. And they say the proposal was discussed extensively in the company, Michael. So Trump Trump and Trump org were, there was Russia all over the place. You know, it's like legitimate business stuff, but they're like, that's what you get for telling us something. And so they hit Cohen with new crimes because he didn't come down on Trump enough. And he just pleads guilty to it all. So apparently there was government response from Russia at some point. Cohen like wasn't clear enough. Boom, crime. So it's like, don't talk to the government or the feds or anybody because everything you say, they'll twist into a pretzel. So, you know, you, you might have a little bit of empathy for Cohen. I mean, not really, I guess. I retract that. But you know, this, this is a, a position that the DOJ can cause anybody to be in. And you, you, you get very curious about how you react in a situation like this. When the DOJ comes to you and they say, you're going to go to prison for 50 years and probably get it. Look at the J6ers, okay? What do you do? Michael Cohen just says, okay, I guess I'm just going to buckle like crazy. And I got to go hit Trump harder. So the letter that he sent to them was now criminalized. He takes a plea deal and it is, you know, considered perjury. So now he's lying in reverse, right? So now he just flips and now everything he's saying is adverse to Trump, even though it wasn't before these charges came. So it's pretty disgusting. So then in 2019, right after he takes these plea deals, now watch what he comes out and says, quick 30 second clip from Cohen. This is in 2019, February. Suddenly he's flipped. Now he says, oh, Trump knew everything about Russia. You need to know that Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about, about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations before I gave it. So to be clear, Mr. Trump knew of and directed the Trump-Moscow negotiations throughout the campaign and lied about it. He lied about it because he never expected to win. All right, so they brought him back out. That was 2019. And he tried to deliver his, you know, Trump rah-rah speech. Now, Michael Cohen, the reason why I said you might have some empathy for the guy is because, I mean, he's probably not that bright, first of all. And number two, the DOJ is corrupt, like through and through against everybody, right? So it's Cohen, doesn't really matter. They just go after whoever they need to, to make a point. And in this case, you know, the DOJ was going after on behalf of the Democrats, somebody who was not hitting Trump enough until they could corroborate him to get him to flip and go, you know, anti-Trump than he did. Now his whole life has now become about living this lie, which is uh, up to him, right? He doesn't have to have a podcast every day you know, ranting through his uh, screen at everybody. 
but he also lied again, right? He keeps lying. Like he lies repeatedly. And even when he's lying under oath to Congress, he lies again about lying under oath to Congress. So we have questions about this. Like when you plead guilty, you can't plead guilty to something you didn't do, right? This is, this is the problem. And here's the, here's the situation now, right? It reverses all the way back to Cohen. Like Cohen keeps burying himself. So let's break this down. This is from Michael Cohen's plea proceeding. This is from the case that he plead, pleaded guilty in. And this was a, a, an excerpt that we talked about previously on this channel where he's asking for his probation to be terminated. But it is we, we bring it up whether he lied in prior proceedings. Okay, so Cohen was brought in Letitia James's prosecution as the star witness in her case. And the question comes up about his guilty plea and about lying to Congress. And here is what the exchange sounded like. This was in his own criminal case where he's trying to terminate probation early. Judge Jesse Furman is a federal judge. And here's what he said about Cohen. He said, you know, first of all, it seems that Cohen did not, he says Cohen did not plead guilty, according to him, to tax evasion, right? So that first set of charges that Cohen says he pleaded guilty to, Cohen has said, I didn't do those things, right? So, okay, but you went in to a judge. He said, under oath, did you? And it's a long process to take a guilty plea. You don't walk in and say, judge says, hey, Michael, you guilty? He's like, uh, yeah, I think so. And then they just call it a day. Okay, it's a long pro Do you, did you, is this your signature? Look at it. Is this yours? Yeah. Did you do, did your attorney explain this to you? Anybody promise you anything, right? Are you awake right now? Like, are you under drugs and influence? Anybody promise you anything not contained in this document? All the things. And you did this, right? And there's a factual basis for this. And ba 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 ba. All this stuff happened. Is that true? Yes. Are you satisfied with the services of your attorney? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Because the last thing you want is a defendant to say that's not true. I didn't do any of that. Where'd that come from? So they go through it in depth. Now, so the question was because he came out in the Latish James trial and he said, "I am not guilty of tax evasion. I didn't do it." And the question was, "Okay, well then why'd you take a guilty plea?" And the answer is probably because the DOJ was threatening him with 50 years in prison, right? Because they needed him to flip, but he can't say that. So he's really kind of stuck right now. He has to say, uh, uh, I had to lie about Trump because the DOJ was pressuring me, right? He, he can't admit that now. So now he has to, he's caught in a lie because he's, the origin is a lie about Trump. So, he says, but I'm not guilty of tax evasion. Why did you plead guilty? He says, well, I, well, I had, you know, I, I lied to Judge Polly. Here's the exchange. Question to Michael Cohen. He's on the stand. Alina Abba, I believe, was doing the questioning. Says, hey, Cohen, did you lie to Judge Polly when you said that you were guilty of counts that you said under oath that you were guilty of? Did you lie to Judge Polly? Michael Cohen says, yes, I did. But you earlier testified that you omitted, and we, we move forward in the transcript, but you earlier testified that you omitted, that you, you, know, you didn't ev evade taxes. Isn't that right? You didn't evade taxes? I did say that. Right. Okay. So you lied when you said that you evaded taxes to a judge under oath because you have to do that in order to take a guilty plea. So is it your honor about this date, this location, you, Michael Cohen, your blah, 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 elements of evading taxes, right? You agree to that. Yes, I do or it's in writing. So is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I lied to a judge. Huh? And in response to those questions from Judge Polly, you lied to him, right? That's the question. Michael Cohen says that's true. All from the transcripts. This is a federal judge citing this saying, huh? So that's three confirmations that Michael Cohen lied. And he's caught in it. So, sir, back during the testimony, so, sir, Cohen, turns out you lied at the time. You lied more than once in federal court. Is that correct? Correct. And when the stakes affected you personally, you lied, right? Correct. And you misled a federal judge? Michael Cohen says, yes, I did. 
right? Because he has to do all this stuff. He's like, I didn't do tax evasion. It's like, well, I have to say that I did. Because they are making me. And if I don't, I'm going to go to prison for a long time. They're just going to indict me. So they use him to manufacture something that is to their ends, right? This is what they do. So then he flips. Now, here's what the judge says, wrapping this up, says, the testimony from this exchange, now that was in Letitia's trial, that exchange, just to put the emphasis on this. He took the stand like months ago and came out and said he lied to a federal judge under oath in another proceeding and then admitted that on the record in Tish's case. And Angeron said he was credible. The judge in that case said he was credible. So then the question is in this case, now the judge here considering his termination of probation says the testimony is more troubling than anything else Cohen has ever said. It gives rise to two possibilities. One has to be true. This is a federal judge writing. It gives the rise to two possibilities. One, Cohen committed perjury when he pleaded guilty before Judge Polly in the original sentencing or the original change of plea, lied, right, committed a crime. Or two, Cohen committed perjury in his October 2023 testimony. Now, either way, it is perverse to cite the testimony as Schwartz did as, as he is somehow committed to upholding the law, right? The, the guy is breaking the law again. And it's probably because the DOJ is, for, you know, he is their person now. I, we need you to go say all of this stuff. And he's, he can't keep his lies straight. So what has Alvin Bragg done about this? What has the DA in Manhattan done? Of course, the chief law enforcement person for that county. What are they doing? Are they prosecuting him? No. Instead, they went and got Alan Weisselberg, Trump CFO, also charged with perjury for something that's not even consequential. But they let his perjury escape. And he just committed it in, in Angeron's courtroom, like around the corner. So Bragg, rather than investigating this, prosecutes someone else. So both sides now have a perjurer. So when Trump calls Weisselberg, they're going to say, oh, you're a perjurer. And we're going to say, well, you've got a perjurer. And they say, well, I guess it's even Stevens. So uh, get rid of both of them. And that's a, an attack, right, to take out Weisselberg. And Bragg is going to put this guy on the stand because he's the key witness. He's the crux, the keystone of who connects all the dots on the payments. So that's Michael Cohen, key witness to the Bragg prosecution. Stormy Daniels, another critical witness for Alvin Bragg. She has a serious background, as we can see here. Stormy Daniels, you know what she does for a living. We'll be probably testifying in this case. And if you're not familiar with her resume, allow us to briefly review. She has been in this game for a long time. Okay, started when she was 17 years old. And what we're going to go through in these next few slides here is a journey about her really kind of seeking the public limelight, right? Kind of being interested in politics, starting in this profession, being very enamored, I believe, by the limelight, the publicity, starts at 17, kind of shoots to prominence, and then needs to make a change, tries to shift into politics before Trump even ever comes on the scene, runs for office, actually. And then suddenly, when she's fading into irrelevance, decides that she's going to bring up this new scandal right in the middle of 2016. And so we'll go down that journey together today. So she began taking her clothes off for money when she was 17, went and had a lot of success, okay? Had a lot of success in this role. Now, look at all these different sort of uh, appearances that she had that are notable, I guess. She was in this film. We'll leave the title out of all of these. 2004, 2017, she was on a TV show, I guess, called Dirt. She played a role in that. She appeared on Maroon 5's music video, okay? She was a pole dancer in that one. She appeared in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. And Steve Carroll is, wa Steve Carell is watching her. She's also in another film in 2007 as a model in Knocked Up. She appeared on Saturday Night Live in 2018 after the, you know, Trump came onto the, the stage. And she appeared as a model in another series 
where she portrayed uh, the Virgin Mary like a degenerate. So that's her background. Now, what you see, right, is somebody who's kind of constantly front and center uh, in the media, and she likes, likes it there. In fact, in 2008, she was really kind of getting involved in politics. Isn't this curious? So this was from the Press Club in Washington, National Press Club, and this was from an event where they were talking about protecting children online, restricted to adults. And 2008, you know, the internet's getting a little carried away there. Stormy Daniels is churning out content. Like, I don't want the youth of America to see that. All right. But you can see, right? Speaking out, seeking that public attention, trying to get involved in political issues. And what did that lead to? She actually ran for office. Here's a story that's over from the Times Picayune. Chris Rose wrote this. You can see this one's back in 2009. No one's even thinking about Trump. She says, a pole boy shop serves up Stormy for lunch. Uh, you're not going to want to eat there, okay? Just avoid. One star. Not good. Now, the sign on the door to Sergio's said, storm warning at noon. It was the official notice that business would not be quite as usual. And that's because Stormy Daniels was on a listening tour in 2009, right? Her words, not mine. She's running around listening to everybody. How can I help you? Now, Daniels is not your run-of-the-mill politician. She's no mouthpiece in a suit. No, she's on the adult business. But don't take Stormy for a dumb blonde. <sighs> Come on. Draft Stormy points out that she could not only perform in her films, but she also writes her films. Wow, really complex uh, uh, storylines in there, I'm sure. And she directs them too. Complicated. Multiple angles. Uh, she was also, it should be noted, the president of her 4-H club in high school in Baton Rouge. So elect me to Congress. Yeah, she's as good as anyone in Congress, I guess. So right, that's the point, right? Constantly seeking to be somebody, right? I'm not just you know, uh, a film star, uh, you know, disgusting pervert, whatever, de degenerate, whatever you want to call her. She is something bigger than this. Now, she gets involved in Donald Trump, okay? No one knows who she is, totally irrelevant. Suddenly, she's involved in this Trump affair. Everyone's asking questions. She ultimately releases this story, okay? We know the allegations, so we'll fast forward. They say that they had an affair. She says, like, one time, whatever, and she, you know, leaves it, you know, you know the story. But then she came out January 30th, 2018, and she actually published this. And my understanding is she did this with Michael Cohen. And this is legitimate, right? She actually signed this. The AP confirms that for us here on the next slide. January 30th, here's what she says, right, about, about Donald Trump. So all that background, she comes out, there's this settlement, they float this around. Hey, there's this relationship, blah, blah, blah. Now, January, before, just before Michael Cohen comes out and also says that he made the payments with his personal money before that happened, Stormy releases this. Over the past few weeks, I've been asked many countless times to comment on reports of an alleged relationship I had with Trump many, 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 many years ago. Fact of the matter is that each party to this alleged affair denied its existence in 2006. Hello? 2011, 2016. 2017, and now again in 2018. All good points. I am not denying this affair because I was paid, quote, hush money, as has been reported overseas in, in overseas-owned tabloids. I am denying this affair because it never happened. Thanks. I will have no further comment on this matter. Yeah, right. She released documentaries this year. Please feel free to check me out on Instagram, at the Stormy Daniels. Don't do it. The Thank you, the Stormy Daniels. Uh, Stormy Daniels, okay? So that's from her. Now, then she recanted all of this. So something changed. Trump called this out. And we know the AP looked into this again. Trump posted this one. Hey, look what I found. Are they going to report on this? And they say, well, um, it's kind of true. AP posted this in March this year, last year. Says a newly released document shows Stormy Daniels admitting she never had an affair with Trump. 
What's the AP say about it? Well, it's just missing context, okay? The signed statement with the denial was publicly released on January 30th. That's true. That is accurate. Not long after, Daniels recanted the statement. Oh, yeah. And said that the affair did occur. She said her denials were due to the non-disclosure agreement. And because the parties involved made it sound like I had no choice but to write that. Okay. Now, the facts, a grand jury, of course, indicted Trump nonetheless. And so between that statement, between Michael Cohen's statement, between even the facts of Stormy's statement themselves, right? 2006, she was repeatedly denying it. All of a sudden, something changes. What is it? Opportunity. We know. And Stormy has some been somebody who's still been, you know, largely living that lifestyle up until relatively recently. Remember this, when Stormy got arrested, this story was also pretty wild. Now, this was something she posted in 2018. She says, I'll be going on stage tonight at Sirens in Columbus to perform for my fans and register voters as planned. All right, going out there to get involved. And she's going to, uh, you know, get people energized, I guess. Can't stop the storm. And then she puts that emoji up there for uh, some reason. Says Storm the Vote, Team Stormy, Basta, Fearless, right? And that was the same hashtag that Michael Avenatti was splaying all over the place. So remember Stormy Daniels was arrested. Now, what ended up happening is pretty interesting. And the officers who were involved actually got reprimanded. Stormy Daniels got paid about 450 grand, give or take, depending on the settlement. And it was an interesting thing. But here's the background on the story and let's pull this open because it's just a wild read. Here is what the Washington Post reported on Stormy Daniels arrest. They said prosecutors have ultimately dismissed the charges against her because she was accused of fondling patrons. This is in 2018. Police had charged Daniels, whose real name is Clifford, with three misdemeanors because of touching at a sexually oriented business in violation of Ohio law. Now there's a technicality that she gets off on here in a minute. Yeah. Says here, authorities accused her of touching a specified anatomical area of individuals who were present at the performance, including police officers. Okay, this is where it gets really problematic. When cops go into locations like this, you know, and maybe have too much of a good time. Daniel's lawyer, Michael Avenatti, said on Thursday morning that there was a sting operation that had been set up. But Thursday afternoon, Stormy came out and announced that there were not going to be any charges. Here's her mugshot. According to a police report, they have this group called Vice Officers, okay, which was later disbanded. So a bunch of Vice Officers wonder what those guys are, you know. Hey, let's, hey, you want to go on patrol tonight? Yeah, let's go on patrol. Yeah, grab the boys. Let's go down to the strip club. We're part of the vice squad. Sure, have a good time. During Daniel's 1130 performance, the report states people in the audience began throwing dollar bills at Daniel's while topless and wearing G-string. She allegedly began forcing the faces of patrons into her chest and using her bare angerons to smack the patrons right in the face. She was accused of fondling the breasts of women in the audience as well. Now, two police detectives and an officer in the club noticed what Daniels was doing, and they approached the stage They're like, oh, that looks fun. Hey, what's going on over here? Now, as she performed in front of a female detective, <laughs> report states that the detective, oh no, Stormy Daniels leaned over, grabbed the detective's head, and began smacking her face with her bare breasts, baby. Just walloping her in the face. That detective right in the face like, no, this is illegal. Stop. She allegedly performed the same acts on a male detective and a third officer too. He's like, that's illegal. Those guys are like, that's illegal. It, it, let me go see if you're going to break the law for me too. They're like, here, illegal me. Here, break the law for me too. They're like, no. No, stop it. No, this is so bad. And she's just having a great time. And then they began fondling 
that officer's buttocks and breasts as well. Oh my gosh, it's just a scene over there, isn't it? Golly, Stormy's just popping everybody off, just swinging them around like helicopters. Now, another police detective who was standing near the bar saw it all happen. He's like, whoa! He's like, officers! According to the police report, that detective then left the club. He's like, okay, I got to calm this thing down, okay? I got three officers who are all uh, uh, in arresting, engaging with Stormy. Someone help. She's, she's got them all under their, her control. And so they all came in. They arrested the cops. <laughs> now, Daniel said on Thursday that she was saddened to hear that the charges for the others had not been dismissed. And what ended up happening is she sued him. So what happened was there was a sting operation, but they let it go. And Stormy's case was dismissed because the law was for local dancers. Apparently it didn't apply to outside dancers. And so they ultimately dismissed the case against her and she sued him and she won a bunch of money. And so it's just a wild story, man. It's like, it's, you know, you can't even, you can't make it up, but so she ends up suing him, CNN reported. Settlement came after a, a year after that and got a $450,000 settlement from, I think, the city. All charges were dropped just 12 hours later. The state's no-touching law did not apply to Daniels because she was not a regular performer. The law states that any employee who regularly appears nude regularly is prohibited from touching patrons, I guess, from, except from your family members, which is weird. It's like, why would your brother be there? Chief Tom made this decision because these officers now. Oh, yeah. So those officers also got reprimanded, by the way. So those officers violated the rules of conduct. OK, the police rules say you can't get motorboated at a strip club. OK, it's not it's not allowed. It's not it's not normally not allowed. I don't think police said in a news release they didn't specify the violations. It's that it's Section B. Don't get motorboated subsection double B or double D all members of the now disbanded vice section. Okay. You don't need a vice section. So a bunch of, uh, officer bros can go in and just get motorboated. <laughs> We're investigating crimes here. Yeah. Two, another round though. Another round here. Make it fast before I arrest you. All right. So that's stormy. Now, it's wild. Now, it's a good thing she got some of that money because she owes a lot of it to Trump, a lot of it. And here is some more background. So she also sued Trump for defamation. And Michael Avenatti, who we'll talk about in a minute, Michael Avenatti was one of her lawyers. She actually had several lawyers. But Stormy sued Trump, lost multiple times, almost tried the E. Jean Carroll type of uh, attack with Roberta Kaplan. And... Here's the story from CNN. They reported that Stormy was ordered to pay Trump now, right? A bunch of money, $120,000. That's in addition to another 500,000. Okay, so that 450 she got f after she was fondling police officers. It, <laughs> which, what a country, right? All right, so uh, half a million dollars. It's like, oh my gosh. So she's got to give that over to Trump. And another $120,000 in legal fees as well. The U.S., Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals sided with Trump. This was a big hit to her. And the reason this, I think, is important is because this shows her absolute bias towards Trump, right? This woman owes Trump, give or take, $620,000 against Trump. Five hundred grand right here plus the 120. That's a lot, right? And she is not going to want to pay that to him. In fact, she has said this, I will go to jail before I even pay a single penny. Okay, I will go to jail before I pay a penny. So what, what does that mean in terms of incentives? Does she have an incentive to stop Trump? Yeah, of course she does. Does she have an incentive to see him lose or be hurt because she doesn't want to pay? Maybe she doesn't have to pay if he goes to jail, right? Because he's in prison for the next 50 years, whatever. So we have a very biased person who also, this is someone who is apparently violating a court order openly on X. Sorry, Stormy. Judge said, you have to. So she says no. So she's openly, willfully violating a court order. 
So between Bragg's two witnesses, they don't have someone who is honest or abides by court orders, like telling the truth under oath or abiding by your payment obligations, either one of them, they're star witnesses. And so that is Stormy. Now Stormy, in order to make some of that money back, has a documentary out. And this is on the Peacock Network. It, it was released in 2024. This documentary was also released just about a week before the original scheduled trial date, which was originally scheduled for March 25th, which is no longer the date. It's been moved to the 15th now, but she tried to time it. And my question is, what other evidence went into this? This is a whole story about the Trump saga that we've seen from the trailer here. So who are the producers? Who are the script writers? Who wrote a note that said, or an email, or who was there during a brainstorming session or during filming that said, oh, do that again, but make it angrier. Angrier that this time. Is there anything else that he did that you can say that was relevant, anything else? And she says, yeah, this too. Okay, so you were prompted about that and you're, you're you know, that's maybe not true because somebody told you, and you maybe embellish that and other people were there. Who's your creative director? And what's he had to say about all right? What is this fictional story that you created and how did you create it? Is Trump allowed to see any of that? No, of course not. Here's the background on this dumb film. She says it's an American documentary produced by somebody called Sarah Gibson, whoever that is, follows Stormy as she navigates being a mother, an artist, an advocate, working hard to reinvent herself. It was like Hunter. She should go talk to Hunter. It had its world premiere on March 8th and was released on March 18th, just a week before the trial was set, scheduled to start. Weird. Stormy Daniels navigates being a mother, and look at this, working hard to reinvent herself after the Trump Stormy Daniels scandal. And they met while working on a project. Yeah, I'm sure it's just terrible. Aaron Lee Carr is a producer. Judd Apatow, executive producer. All right. So now that's Stormy. So she's got a lot of incentive to exaggerate the story to get more money to pay Trump back and to get more people to watch her film to get more money. So it's all lacking in credibility, right? Her bias is just unbelievable. And she also, by the way, the reason I brought up her arrest is because she blames Trump for that. She says that she was targeted, right? That Trumpers went out and tried to target her. So she's also got a vendetta in addition to that. And they did an investigation locally at that, at that police department, determined it was not political, but certainly it was inappropriate as we saw. So can Trump see any of this discovery? Can he peer inside and see what's actually going on? He has asked NBC and Judge Mercon for a subpoena. They have denied it. Remember this one, this was a decision in order on NBC's motion to quash the subpoena. And Mercon said, nope, sorry, Trump, no access. NBC's motion to quash is granted. And he scheduled that, signed that one right before the trial is starting on April 5th. So Trump can't see what went into that and how Stormy is monetizing this entire process, just like the judge's daughter is. Michael Avenatti, you know him. He is in prison. Whether we see him in trial or not is yet to be seen. Time will tell, but you remember him. He was a lawyer to Stormy Daniels in 2016 when a lot of this was happening. He sued to invalidate an NDA with Trump, sued Trump for defamation with Stormy, lost that one big time. They owe Trump money on that. Currently serving 19 years. And I didn't realize it was so long. I thought it was actually less time than that. But 19 years, I think starting 2022, give or take. He'll be out in less time than that, obviously. But extortion with Nike for millions. Embezzlement from clients. And apparently even stole from Stormy Daniels in a book deal. A couple hundred thousand dollars from her too. So take that for what it's worth in terms of his credibility. But he knows Stormy well, and he called in and talked about the Bragg prosecution being the wrong case at the wrong time. And here was just a quick segment from that. 19. One of the big things that I learned, unfortunately, is that what I had been sold by Ms. Daniels relating to how this payment had came about and what I had subsequently advocated on television and others in reliance on what she had told me turned out to be completely false. Uh, it had been represented to me that she had not attempted to extort 
Donald Trump uh, and the campaign in the waning days of 2016, that they had come to her. Uh, and I believed her when she told me that repeatedly. Unfortunately, in early 2019, I came to learn that that was not true. Does it matter to the legal case who initiated it if, uh, as you said earlier tonight, Donald Trump still lied about it and potentially lied to the government about it? I don't think from a legal perspective it matters, but I think very well from an optics standpoint it could matter. And again, I believe he'll be convicted in the case, but I don't think it's going to move the needle to the degree that some people believe that it will. I think We'll see about that. They're going to try to shift this from the hush money case into an election interference case, as we'll talk about in our next segment. But that is Michael Avenatti calling into the into the show for an update. And the jury is about to be selected. And we're going to be covering that here. So starting on Monday, April 15th, we're expecting 18 total jurors who will be selected. And it may take a while to get there because of the complexities of this case. Remember, there were about 42 different jury questions that the judge was asking about. Are you a member of the Proud Boys? You watch Fox News? Do you like True Social? What's it? What's your story, right? All those questions. And so my understanding is, is that we are going to have 12 jurors for sure, who will be the final jurors on the panel. And we will have up to six alternates who will be there in case something happens. And so we'll have a full panel when the trial starts and we'll see how it unfolds here together. And so we are now much more up to speed on the Bragg prosecution, and we'll be here when this thing kicks off on Monday. Security seemingly is ready to go as well, and they have shared this with us, that the U.S. New York PD, U.S. Secret Service, New York Unified Court System, all are ready to go. Secret Service, Police Department, Unified Court System are working together to ensure the utmost level of safety during Trump's criminal proceeding in New York. Secret Service is prepared. We're going to carry out our protective mission. Now, they say while operational security precludes us from going into specifics, Secret Service will not seek any special accommodation of outside what would be required to ensure the continued safety of the former president. We have the utmost trust and confidence in our law enforcement. We're ready to go. Police commissioner says we're ready to go. Longstanding relationships, no problem. And chief department of the unified court system says we've been coordinating with everybody. And so everything will move smoothly and we'll see. So Trump is expected to be there and he'll probably be bogged down there absent some excusal from the court for the remainder of the trial, which is exactly what the Democrats want. And if you recall, we'll have Wednesdays off of trial testimony, I believe. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, it is going to be trial season, my friends. And so we're going to be here continuing to cover it. Thank you so much for subscribing and joining us as we do. Thanks for liking this video. Thanks for inviting a friend or family member to come over and join us. We got a lot to unpack as the trial unfolds. And now we've got our bearing straight. We got some slides. We have an understanding of who is who and how this is all working. And so We'll assemble it together, journey through it together. The first prosecution of a president in our history, maybe will be the only one in our lifetimes because there's a lot that could happen as a result of this. But thank you for joining us, my friends. Don't forget to check out some of the links down in the description below. We have our sovereignty and our self-development community at watcherlodge.com. We do sovereignty Saturdays on Saturday. Click on over in the link to watcherlodge.com and come register and join us all free. It's going to be a lot of fun. We also have our members only community at watching the watchers.locals.com where you can become a member, get access to our streams that we do every morning, our Saturday shows as well. And also if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to grab a shirt. We have a new shopping tab. And so we got some Travis Matthew polo shirts in there. Join the polo revolution. Let's save America. Look good doing it together. We'll see you back on locals at watching the watchers.locals.com and back here on the next one. All right, my friends, we're not done yet. Don't go anywhere. We got another segment to attend to, and then we're going to jump into your comments. Thank you so much for your amazing super chats. Thank you for those, my friends. Let's get into it on 
this segment. Democrats are shifting the narrative. They're going from hush money trial now to election interference trial. Isn't that interesting? It's because the first stopped mattering to people a long time ago because it involves liars, perjurers, and a corrupt prosecutor who are trying to go after Biden's political opponents through people like Matthew Colangelo and others. But the shift is now happening in the court of public opinion as well. This is Lanny Davis. You know him. He's a major TDS attorney, someone who has been involved in Democrat politics for a long time, even advising Michael Cohen in some instances. And here is what he said. It's no longer about hush money. And if people are making fun of this case, you got to correct the record with them. Okay. This is what the lefties are being told and being taught from their MSNBC overlords. Get in their faces and tell them that this is truthfully about election interference. Well, let me quote Donald Trump's Justice Department's prosecutors in public when they made the charge that Donald Trump, and they wrote this, directed Michael Cohen to pay this money to Ms. Daniels. They said this case is about the impairment of democracy by allowing wealthy people such as Mr. Trump to buy silence a few days before the election to prevent the American people from gaining information they need. They describe this case as about democracy. Mm -hmm. That's the Federal District of New York, Southern District of New York prosecutors in a public document. Well, why did they prosecute Trump then, Lanny? They could have charged him. They didn't. How come? Why don't you ask Jeffrey Berman about that? How come Joe Biden's DOJ didn't reinstitute this and charge him? Huh? Very curious, Lanny, because it's not about that at all. Hiding in plain sight. So every time someone describes this in a disparaging way as about sex or something else, quote, Donald Trump's prosecutors describing this case as seriously about the undermining of democracy. Okay, so he's like, please talk about it in a way that will matter more than intercourse with some stormy, okay? And Michael Cohen, like the worst people in the world. Make it mean something. People don't think this means anything. People think this is is, is meaningless. So make it, make it up, right? Aggravate it out there. Get in their faces to use that representative's language. So let's see what some other attorneys, judges, and other uh, commentators have to say about this. You know Jonathan Turley does great work on X and everywhere else. Here is what he said about this when they brought him on, talking about some options that Trump might have to emerge victoriously in this case. Well, they're not very surprising. These are fairly uh, standard and predictable moves. The first one being that you have to uh, destroy Michael Cohen's credibility, but there's not much there to destroy. I mean, this is the ultimate bottom feeder witness where uh, the question is whether the jury is going to recoil by the prosecutors putting him on the stand. He was just denounced by a judge for being a serial perjurer. And so it doesn't really help to say, well, that's that. so last week. I'm, I'm testifying in another case, he has this long litany of false statements, conflicts. You know, he pleaded guilty uh, under oath and then later said that he wasn't telling the truth. To the astonishment of many of us, he was never prosecuted for that perjury uh, by the Justice Department. And now he's appearing as a witness for a prosecution team. So it's wild. And they just turned around and they just prosecuted Weisselberg. It, this is just a very strange universe that we have entered in this case. Bizarro land. The second Bizarro issue land. involves a fairly standard motion that occurs when uh, you believe that the jury may not agree that the big ticket item of a charge, the felonies, is proven. And you want the court to give an instruction saying you can always convict on lesser included offenses, in this case a misdemeanor. Now, sometimes the that defense the says want to do degree. that. Sometimes they just want to leave the jury with the cliff option, uh, thinking that they don't want to go over the cliff, so they'll go ahead and acquit. But many times this works in favor of the defense. Mm. For Trump, there could be personal resistance to even suggesting a possible misdemeanor conviction. But politically and legally, it would be a very significant mm. advantage for him. A couple of things. Uh, Lanny Davis, the attorney for Michael Cohen, I don't know how he's paying him, uh, says there's more than just Michael Cohen to testify against Trump. Do you know of anything about this? 
<laughs> well, you know, I've been critical of this case uh, since it was filed. This is the weaponization of the criminal justice system. That's right. This Jonathan is a bizarre Curry. case. And in fact, that second strategy makes sense because this was always a misdemeanor under state law, but it's the sexual limitations had run. So what they did here is they bootstrapped a federal crime and they're going to prosecute it essentially in state court. And now this is a crime that the Department of Justice rejected. They didn't believe that there could be yeah. a basis for charging under the federal election uh, uh, laws, at least not a credible one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the way they're getting around that is Mershon is saying it's not that they had to prosecute it or that there needs to be evidence that he committed or or is guilty of the crime. It's just that he had intent to commit the crime. And you go, what? So you can read it. So you have to have intent to commit a crime in the first place. But they're saying you have intent to commit the crime and you did the action to commit the crime. And as part of the elements, one of those elements is that you intended to commit another crime. Well, what's the evidence of that other crime? Well, it's pretty broad. It's kind of whatever we say it is. Okay, so that's Mershon. And he gave us four different theories, right? And they were federal election crimes. So they said Trump violated federal election crimes, even though the SDNY looked at it and they said he didn't, or at least they didn't prosecute him for it. The other one was a tax crime locally in New York that there was a violation for grossing up Michael Cohen's pay. And then there was one other one, three essential uh, philosophies that we've talked about in our review. So this is Jonathan Turley wrapping up. So you have this really odd effort in order to sort of take a federal offense, rejuvenate a misdemeanor, and then convict him for a felony. Uh, and it's just, in my view, raw political manipulation of the criminal justice system. Yeah, he's right. And the third element, the third opportunity to say that there was a felony that he could have committed. So again, it's Trump falsified a business record with the intent to conceal the commission of another crime. So intent to commit or to commit another crime. And they were also saying that Trump was violating the law, which is falsifying evidence essentially for a candidate who's running for office, right? False information, false campaigning on behalf of a candidate. So that's Jonathan Turley. I think good analysis. And he's right. It's bizarre. The whole situation is what's going on in New York. It's like, okay. And this is Judge Andrew Napolitano also weighing in. What's coming up in New York? Cameras in the courtroom. Um, was this, has this been a positive for oh, overall, the way trials play oh, out? That is a great question. Not in this case where Judge Ito, who was running for election, pandered to the cameras almost uh, talking about OJ courts in the unions in the courtroom Trump um, this starts Monday this hush money trial is going to begin um, if there are cameras allowed in the courtroom if the judge rules that is that good for Donald Trump to have those cameras there well I don't uh, think he can the former president is a master at taking uh, misfortune and turning it into his political benefit so if he is berated by the judge for example uh, seeing that on camera, Donald Trump will be able to take that clip mm -hmm. and use it in a, in a That's commercial. That's why they don't want his, to uh, put the camera yeah. seeking, the, uh, seeking the presidency. Yeah. But overall, I can't say if it'll be good uh, or bad for him. In one respect, he's got to behave himself in a, in a procedure that is essentially boring. This is not a trial like you see on television or, or in the movies. 90% of it is boring, boring, boring. He has to sit there. He has to be there 100% of the time, four days a week. They're going to take Wednesdays off. That day may float, but they're going to sit for four days a week. All right, so he is going to be bogged down there. Uh, good, good thing he has nothing else important going on, you know, like an election. Here is Greg Jarrett, our final commentator on this conversation, talking about the trial. Just do this, look at this trial, see the 76-year-old CFO of Trump Organization back in Rikers while uh, illegal immigrants shoplift and ransack stores, beat up cops. No one gets charged for crimes. There seems to be Donald, are they the country around? Livius, and I think they're, you know, delusional. Uh, you know, these indictments all have one common denominator, Brian. They're politically driven. And Americans see this for what it is, an abuse of our legal system meant to interfere in the presidential election. I hope so. Uh, but, you know, polls show it's backfiring 
only solidifying Trump's support. And voters see him really as a villain, uh, not as a villain, rather, but as a victim of unscrupulous political enemies who are weaponizing the law. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see how it turns out. All right. We'll be here, of course, covering this when it drops uh, on Monday. And our plan is we're going to go through the X scripts. I think many people will probably be there in their our observation rooms with cameras and uh, screens where they can watch what's happening inside the courtrooms. So my hope is we are going to see some live tweeting, some live Xing of the trial, and we're going to be covering it, recreating it, and we'll have our slide decks to keep our bearing straight on who is who and how the testimony is unfolding. And as usual, we'll keep tabs on the jurors. We'll try to recreate who's on the jury, who they are, where they come from, age, location, demographics, all that type of stuff. And so we'll be here in trial mode and I hope you join us as we do. Thanks for being here, my friends. It's a beautiful Friday. Thanks for subscribing and liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. We've got a great members only community. We do live streams in the mornings, every weekday and on Saturdays. We'd love to have you come and join us watching the watchers.locals.com. We do after parties there, an amazing community. And we get into some other things that we can't squeeze into here on the show. So come and join us watching the watchers.locals.com. We'll see you there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground. Of course, we got. Dems screaming about election interference as they are literally interfering with the election. Isn't that fun? And we're now up to speed. Trial prep. Stormy and Cohen exposed. We know who they are. We know what their background is. And trial starting on Monday. And so now, my friends, let's hear from you. Of course, we are going over to locals as soon as we're done here for our members only after party. But first, it is time to see what you guys have to say about this. And thank you so much, my friends, for the amazing uh, donos and super chats. This one came in from Glocky in the house. What's up, Glocky? Glocky says, correct me if I'm wrong, but admitting you don't have evidence of a crime usually means you can't try someone. And concealing documents and removing documents is considered tampering with evidence and usually results in you being charged for a crime. Julie Kelly dropped some bombshells from the hearings in Florida. Man, sounds good. We're gonna have to catch up with Julie Kelly. Make sure you're following Julie Kelly at Julie underscore Kelly two on X for the latest over there. Chubby stubby, nine months chubby. That's a baby in the house. Woo! Our newest baby watching, watching the watchers. Looking nice and healthy and strong. Good to see you chubby. Thanks for being here. Glocky's here. Hey, does someone else remember the media screeching about how Trump's donors were paying his legal bills and how he's a con man. Yeah, it's funny how they don't mention that the Democrats are paying Joe Biden's bills. DNC paid one and a half million for Joe Biden's classified docs. Isn't that fun? Everything they accuse the other side of doing, they do. Glocky says, Joe tried getting his appeal electronically filed, but typical New York City has a clause in their filing that he has to serve the assistant AG of New York. So he's dropping the paperwork off first thing on Monday morning. Perfect. Keep on keeping on. Thanks for the update, Glocky. Shout out to our friend Joe. We got this one. Glocky says, you know, honestly, he should just go for it. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Trump comes out. He has the beard and the ball. He's like, it's go time, baby. Make America great again. Version 2.0. Uh, they would flip. Hey, here's one from Glocky. This looks like it's meme Friday. Says, Senator for 36 years. Vice president for eight years blames Trump for America's problems. I know it's funny. They all do that. Can you believe Trump has done this? You're like, you've been in office for a hundred years. What are you talking about? Glocky says, uh, Babylon B is reporting unhinged Trump threatens more violence by promising to trigger a landslide on election day, which is a violent thing to say. It's very dangerous rhetoric. What's he saying? He wants you to be buried under dirt so you suffocate and die just like Hitler. Yeah. Good stuff on that one. <laughs> it's a landslide. All right. Here's one from Glocky. Uh, you know how this goes. 
you know, you meet a nice woman, you're driving down the road, you're like going to go get some lunch or something. You drive down, do, 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 do. Hey, how this, how's this restaurant look? Looks good. Oh, look, there's Trump. She says, I hate Trump. And then there's a solution to the problem. Trump hops in and we go to Mar-a-Lago to save America. Adios. We got this one from Glocky. We're going to get Trump this time. And here's this person with, with a couple. This is a good caricature of what we're talking about here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're going to get Trump this time. Hey, wow, look at you. Just hanging in there. Hey, all right, good for you. <laughs> good for you. You're still around. Wow, good for you. Nice. Still kicking. That's great. <laughs> all right. Here's one from Glocky. Another one from Glocky. It's like Meme Friday, man. It's like Meme Friday. Here's one from Glocky. Uh, no, sir. No incriminating evidence in Trump's safe from the FBI. <laughs> Uh, just a note that said any Fed who reads this is double gay. Sir, I read it. <laughs> the FBI is having a crisis there. If you read this letter, you're a total loser. It's like, I read it. Ah! <laughs> Here's one from Glocky. Uh... <laughs> Here's one. I told a liberal that I, I identify as Trump gender, okay? They got so offended that they actually told me, you're wrong, there are two genders, you know? No, I'm, I'm a Trump, I, I identify as Trump. You say, they say you can't do that. There's only men and female, okay? Get, get used to it. Hey, Fred is here, says Fred Petamonte was doing some research. I accidentally found Karen McDougal's Playboy pics. Acc well, for research, I'm sure you were doing research over there on uh, the show. You're getting prepared for the trial. It's trial prep. Glocky says, here's one. Hey, here's the, the left screaming, Trump colluded with Russia. Hillary, that was me. Trump kept kids in cages. Obama, that was me. Trump obstructed an active investigation. Pelosi and Schumer say that was us. And Trump had a quid pro quo in Ukraine. Joe says that was me. Here's one, another one from Glocky, just firing him off on locals. This is why you got to come over on locals, my friends. Here's Joe, the pirate, says, this is the day you'll always remember as the day, oh, it's Trump. <laughs> I couldn't see who it was. This is the day you'll always remember as the day you almost caught President Donald J. Trump. That, that was on at the gym today. That is really weird. That show, that movie was on at the gym. This is from Glocky, says, why was it a crime for Nixon to wiretap at Watergate, but okay for Obama to wiretap the Republicans at Trump Tower? Great question. Another one from Glocky says, when this picture was taken, Obama knew the plan to frame Trump was active. Here's one from Glocky. If Trump was Speaker of the House, this is what it would look like. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. Hey, and thank you, Glocky, for the meme-tastic Friday. Just amazing. Just amazing. And that's over on Locals, my man, my friends. That's over on Locals. So come join us. Thank you, Glocky. I'm, I'm like laughing. I got like tears in my eyes from the uh, from that cartoon of that lefty. Uh, Red One says, turn 40 today. Hey, 40 is the new 30, man. That's what I'm telling myself. I don't feel old yet from Red One. I know I'm 38, man. I'm getting up there. We're going to be uh, we're going to be the same age soon. I'm catching up to you. Good to see you, Red One. Thanks for being a membo. We got Hold My Halo. Gifted a membo. One new membo coming in from Hold My Halo going to the Real Hydro PX in the house. Glocky is sharing this called Pelosi's Insurrection from our friends, the Gateway Pundit. Said, and did I say happy birthday to you, Red One? Happy birthday to you. Did I say that? I thought I did, but I don't think I did. Happy birthday to you, Red One. Cowboy Rob, thank you for this. And the Gateway Pundit saying, National Guard whistleblowers are going to testify that they were ready to be deployed on J6, but the Pentagon delayed their orders. Will destroy J6 committees, big lie. Yeah, I sure hope so. Good. To, that's from the Gateway Pundit. Cowboy Rob says, my question to you as a lawyer is, why can't you expose the prosecutor pressuring you to testify a certain way or to take a plea deal? Well, it's, there, it's just part of the, pro, like they're allowed to do it. Like it's just part of the system. 
the prosecutor can come to you and it's just, it's legal. Like they'll say, yeah. And, and, and by like, they're not going to get, they're not going to go in there and say like, it's just how it is. It's just how it works. They say, we can convict you of all of these crimes, but we need you to testify. But if you, if you agree to this factual basis, we'll give you this deal. Do you want it? Yes or no. And they can charge you. I mean, that's like, it's just part of the, if they can prove those claims and you committed those crimes and you think that they have the evidence, it's the nature of the law, man. It's like, it's wild, but it's just how it is. Here's one from Milo phone bill. Thank you. Milo phone bill for sending two of these in says a lie in time saves nine talking about the, maybe the Supreme court switching to save the nine. Interesting comment from Milo. Hey, hey, it's the Monkets is gifting one membo. Will 2023 is coming in courtesy of Tony Hay. Hey, what's up? Knox is here. Oh, man. Hey, Knox is here. She's a defense attorney in the great state of Texas. Says TGIF all a long, horrible week for your girl here. Uh Uh-oh. Sorry to hear that, Knox. Says one judge made me so angry I donated to his opponent. And I'm not even registered to vote here. Arizona landowners vote in Arizona. Whoa, Knox, what judge, what judge was that? I'm curious about. Nah, maybe we'll leave that off the stream, but we could talk about that in private. But interesting, horrible week. Sorry that the judge did that. Hopefully he loses his election. Tree Climber sharing this one from Dark S, Dark Dark, ins- Dark Insider. Tree Climber is bringing in a new membo. And Red One is bringing in new membos as well. And Red One is celebrating a birthday and bringing in new members, 40th birthday celebration. Thank you, Red One. Bringing in designed audio, LNT. We got Myra Page. We got the Caribbeans here, Mr. P. We got Brad T, Mela D, James H, Michelle B, PK. And what's up, Rich and Don? We got new members coming in courtesy of Red One. Happy birthday to Red One. New members, we're celebrating Red One in the house. Radice is over on local says, I'm sure you meant to say that Stormy wasn't charged because of her dancing. We might have to get mama G to look over your scripts. Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. I don't think we want mama G watching the stormy segments. You know, it's not, not appropriate for moms out there. Angel says, I would love to see the video of stormy and the officers at the strip club. Surely somebody video the cops being attacked by her swinging breasts. Stormy Daniels, motorboat and everybody. Those cops, help, I'm under attack. I'm, I, I'm, there's a crime in progress, stop. Rocky Water says, Rob, I kind of dig on the PowerPoint format, if, if I may call it a little Ziegler-esque, no? You mean like Garrett, the purveyor of this? I don't know that it, that holds a can, I don't know my, my little dinky PowerPoints even holds anything to that. But seems a good, efficient format, says, keep spreading that word a sh- and a shine in that light, brother. Yeah, Rocky, the reason we're kind of shifting to PowerPoints, it's really, I think, only for the trial. The mind maps are great. So the reason why you're seeing a little bit of a different format is because the mind maps, they're a little bit too linear, I would say. Like, it's hard... It's a little bit, slides I think are a little bit more modular. So I can keep adding to a slide, right? A slide, let me, I guess slides are a lot more linear, but I can keep adding to them in a way that I can't really do the mind map and kind of organize my thoughts in a way. So I want one, we're going to have six weeks of trial and I don't want six different weeks of mind maps. I'd rather just keep all the Cohen stuff on one, one section, the stormy stuff on one section. And so we'll just keep filling it out as it uh, expands. So that's the reason for the shift. And then as soon as that, like when we go through the show during the week, a lot of it's just kind of, we don't need to aggregate it, bundle it. I can bundle in PowerPoint, which, which is a little harder to do on the mind map. But yes, I, it is it is a little Ziegler-esque. I will say that I am inspired by Ziegler, sure, no doubt about that. He, I think, he'd probably laugh at my attempt at this, but maybe we'll talk to him about it, see what he says. Hey, Knox is here. 
Rob, we need to trial prep. I get a little nervous there. Prayers for the defense team all. Uh, tell me about it. I know. Yeah, we're, I've also got, so I've got uh, this slide deck that I have, Knox, is like hundreds of slides, I think. I don't, I don't know how many it is. They're not done yet, but it's kind of the thoughts. And we're going to keep building out the defenses and organizing the defenses. And then hopefully we'll have a nice set of closing arguments as well, right? So all the closing arguments that we are able to extract from this will assemble into a slide deck and then have closing arguments. And then the theory is we want this to be, be shareable. So how do we bundle this so many people can see it so that if Trump is convicted, we can have the best arguments that are consolidated to show that this was just a railroad job. NY says election interference. So when they stop the story on Hunter Biden's laptop, that's not interference. The Dems are professional liars. No one believes them except their demented followers. Just Rhonda, what's up, Just Rhonda? Super generous. Thanks for bringing in a 10 new membos. We got Zon B's here. We got Anonymous is here. Philip H, Ty BB, Renowin Outcast, Laser Man is here. That's cool. Douglas W, not gullible. We got W McMaster, Golden Gaming, and Will W all in the house. Gifted membos, courtesy of our membo, a Just Rhonda. Thank you, Just Rhonda. Great to have you. Michael Allen Hughes says, what if Trump pleads no contest? Could he appeal? No, no contest is basically guilty and it's not anything else. It's your, it'd be Trump pleading guilty. So he's not going to do that. And you can't appeal something when you plead guilty because you're agreeing to do it. You haven't been found anything. Salty Sarge says merchants, uh, Mercon's clerk made good logic file an additional clarification brief. It's bureaucracy gumming up the works. Well, that sounds about right why not muck it up? But good logic is relentless. He'll continue on. Chubby's here says, hearing them talk about Ido in the OJ trial sounds a lot like Judge Ariola. Yeah, you remember that? I remember. I mean, I was a, just, a, I was like in second grade, I think, when that OJ trial was going on. But I remember it. I remember where I was. It's a wild scene. Good to see you, Chubby. We got Jennifer in the house. Says, thank you for the part two summary, Rob. Now I feel all caught up for Monday. Thank you, Jennifer. That was the goal. It was to kind of consolidate six years of nonsense into a couple days, make sure we have our bearing straight. And I feel like we're pretty well set. Pretty well set. We got, hey, Pope Rackets touched me again, again. Somebody needs to put a stop to this. Force their heads into her chest mountains. I know those poor officers are so upset with themselves. Hey, honey, how was your day? Oh, it was good. Just out there protecting and serving our family. You know? Yeah, really? Yeah. Dodging bullets. <laughs> okay. We got this one from NY says, speaking of legal bills, who is paying Lanny Davis's bill? A lot of these guys, I think, are just working kind of pro bono for free. They, as long as it's anti-Trump, that's enough payment for them. Cowboy Rob says, dude, these Democrats and liberals forget that half of our military and half our police force are U.S. Republicans and people that may disagree with your plot to take over the country. Yeah, I think the Democrats forget a lot about that, about the people who actually produce things in this world. Like Tish. Like if you had a thousand Tishes in a city or a thousand Trumps, who would get something built and, and functional? Which one? Wh like clearly, which person? And if, if that's just, you just magnify that times, you know, it's a broad generalization, but I think that one side of America is learning how to build things, like literally, right, in the services, in the trades, in industries that actually produce real world benefits. Others are talking about pronouns and gender ideology. It's like that's not really an applicable skill, which is why they have to create these institutions for them to serve. And then they grift off the other institutions to fund the existence of themselves. So when things stop working for them, like who do they turn to? They've got to turn to people who actually produce stuff. NY's in the house. Says NY, how does the, NY Renal on Locals says, how does any Biden campaign message get through the attention grabbing nature of prosecuting Trump? Do they not see it backfiring? I don't, I mean, I think they think there's nothing else to talk about really. They have no other options. What are they going to talk about? Their record? This is their campaign. 
Hey, Jennifer says, just wanted Glocky McGlocky to know the YouTube chat was rolling at those those memes. Those were those were fire memes today, Glocky. Those were like major contributions. Those were great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Glocky. Laughing, it's hilarious. I was crying, man. I had tears in my eyes. <laughs> hey, Grant. What's up, Grant? Smash the like button, baby. Thank you, Grant, for saying that and reminding everybody that just very just get a little click right there. Very easy. Blackheart, what's up, Blackheart? Says, out of curiosity, how is releasing a documentary around the same time as the trial and involving the same topic as the trial not jury tampering? Well, it's because Trump didn't do it. You know, and nobody is um, going to be influenced by Stormy, but they're all going to be influenced by Trump. And they just say Trump's got a big megaphone. He's a billionaire, whatever. But it's, it's, you know, it's clearly orchestrated, coordinated. They colluded to get that done, to time it perfectly. Trump can't even see what went into it. That's how corrupt it is. Thank you, Blackheart. Nice dono. Good to see you today. Hey, Knox is here. Says, I love the group defense pool. I always think of great things when I am, quote, just observing. It would be awesome if we could outline and forward it to the defense team. Yeah, you know, I've thought about that, Knox. I don't know if they're, you know, are, would they be receptive to that, do you think? It's like we were offering suggestions during the Chauvin trial, and I think some of those made it into the trial. So now that I think about it, it's like, man, maybe, maybe they are watching. But, you know, when you're in trial, you're kind of like, you're kind of in the fog of war. You know, it's like, it's like uh, hard to see outside of your bubble. So I'm wondering if they're receptive to that. But it's a great idea, Knox. I mean, if you got ideas, I'm game for them. So that's the point. Like, that's the point of assembling these slides. So like, Knox, if you're like, hey, dummy, you should have a slide that says this. Oh, great. Let's add that. Because we're going to be curating and re revising these slides over the next six weeks, which is why I wanted them there. And I also want them to be very accessible so that, you know, if I share them, other people can share them with people. Or if um, I go speak on someone else's channel, right? We can, we can reference the slides. We have it all chronicled. We have our sources, cite your sources, all the things. So it's, you know, it's a little bit more accessible. So I'm open to feedback, man. So if anybody out there is listening and you say, hey, Beef that up, beef that up, beef that up. Let us know. Thank you, Knox. NY says, question. If Trump is being tried in state court for a federal crime, can he grant himself an appeal later? So I don't think that's uh, like actually happening. So if he's being tried in state court on a state crime that is being, they say it's a felony because he intended to commit a federal crime or he intended to commit another crime in New York. So a state court wouldn't have jurisdiction over a federal crime. So he, but he could appeal the state conviction, the state conviction, that would be appealable. B-man's in the house says, I thought the judge said that President Trump didn't have to be there. Uh, I think previously, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be there for trial. Like Secret Service is going to be there. It's a criminal trial. You almost, I mean, unless they're doing a trial in abstention or something, you got to be there for your trial. And there's a jury there. Like you want the jury to see you there for your trial. You don't want a jury to think, where's the defendant? If it's not important to him. What do we care? What's up, Rudd? Rudd says, glad to be in this community. You are number one. Thank you. Well, what, Rudd, I think that about you, my friend. So thanks for being a Membo, man, for one month. Great to have you here. Community is all of us, and we're grateful that you're a part of it. And Knox says, I think if we keep it brief and maybe get someone's ear, I know they're fabulous, but we all forget during the fog of war. Slides would be a great way. Yeah, and that's, that's also why I'm doing the slides for this. It's to make it a little bit more accessible. Like, I know the mind map is cool. I mean, I think it's cool, but it is a little bit harder to access. Slides are just, you could just print them out. Like you can't really print out a mind map, you know, it's all organic. So slides, you can just print out and uh, share email, all the things. So I wanted to bundle up, make it a little bit more accessible and even make it like closing arguments, close boom, 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 boom. Just like we might do in a trial Knox. That's kind of the, kind of the theory. So we'll continue to, I just started working on them like three days ago. I mean, in, in seriousness. So there's still a lot of work to do a bunch of slides that, that are still in my brain that we ha haven't had time to fill out yet. So 
We'll see. Th thank you, Knox, defense attorney in Texas. Good stuff, Cookin. And I think it is important to crowdsource this stuff. I think that it matters. And I think there was some, you know, some benefit to that during Chauvin and other trials that we've covered here. All right, let's see who's joining us on X and see who is in the house on the day. And uh, Law of Attraction says, as a lawyer, you support a lot of illegal acts, which I totally disagree with. I don't think I've ever endorsed anybody breaking the law. So I don't know what that's about. V is never silent says, happy Friday, watchers. Good to see you. V is never silent. We got this one from Azok. What's up, Azok? Fred says, you'll never be the same age as Red One. Nuh-uh, I'm catching up. As soon as I turn 39, I'll be catching up. He'll always be two years older than you. Fred, why do you have to be so negative? Don't be a naysayer. I am catching up. Raven says, like helicopters. Bah, ha, ha, ha. Like helicopter. Oh, that was the Stormy Daniels conversation. Yeah. This woman, what kind of movie is this? Sarah Gibson, pass. We got Feline Fun says, I'm praying and holding out hope that somehow two or three strong, honest Republicans get on the jury. Or just honest people would be nice. They don't even have to be Republicans, just honest. And have the fortitude to stand during the deliberations. We had this one from Azok said, Strange, if I had not found your channel and others during the trucker convoy, I would probably believe that Trump is guilty and deserve what he got. Thanks for opening my eyes. Now check the stories myself and don't believe the mainstream media. Cheers for the red pill. That's a great comment. Thanks for saying that one. Yeah, that's a great comment. James says, that, that's like what we're trying to do here. You know, we're trying to help people see the truth. And we're glad, uh, Azok, thanks for being willing to say that. You know, a lot of people wouldn't be willing to even say that. James says, all cases in New York under Tishy and the DA should be thrown out in New York because they've probably proven they can fix a trial. Everything is criminal and civil will have to be retried or the prisons open due to the corruption from James Pepper. Good comments over there on X, my friends. And if you want to follow us over on X, the address is at Rob Govea, ESQ. You can come join us over there. Would love to see you. And it's a great way to follow other fellow watchers out there in the wilderness on the X platform. We had... This one from B-Man says they are already biasing the jury. They're asking questions about QAnon and the Proud Boys garbage. Yeah, if you missed that, we covered the judge's jury instructions, the questions to the jury. And so that was earlier this week. And Woodchip Bill says, Rob, if you know and know, don't try, then you'll never know. If you know don't, and you don't try, then you'll never know from Woodchip Bill. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where this goes and how this all starts to unfold. It's going to be, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to be here, my friends. Thank you so much for sending those donos in. And we're very grateful for all of your support. We are going to wrap up, go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party and debrief. And of course, we'll be back in the morning for our members for our Saturday stream. And then as soon as we're done in this, on Saturday, we're going to watcherlodge.com. And so click on over, come and join us. Go to watcherlodge.com. We got a bunch of news stories we're dropping there every day. So like those, comment on those if you want to see what's cooking. They're my seedlings. So go watch the videos if you want to see what we're waiting for something to burst through any day now. And we also have on the community calendar our Saturday sovereignty event. So sign up, add those to your calendar, and we'll be excited to see you over there for our Saturday Sovereignty streams. We also have robertgovea.com, PDF, newsletter, show calendar. We got our reports there. Merch store, all there. Come check it out, robertgovea.com. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. Before we wrap it up, I want to thank the mods and the meme smiths and those clipping away for us. We got John McGarvey, Donut Mind Me, we thank Economy Pilot, Dog Digger, Janek, Zach Nichols, Ronnie Cole, Playing Hooky, Just Cause, and K Beans always clipping for us in the mornings. Shout out to our mods and our meme smiths, Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Jigam Gigam for making this place nice and beautiful. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We are going to leave it there. And head on over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Would love to see you come and join us. But if not, well, that's okay. 
We have a beautiful weekend ahead. It's going to be an amazing one, no doubt about it. And hopefully you had an incredible week and that that enables you to unplug for the weekend so that you can recover, restore your energy tanks, rejuvenate your soul and your spirit, spend time with friends and family, the people that we love, get outside, get some fresh sunshine, fresh air, vitamin D and all the good things because we're going to come back on Monday and we're going to get into it again. And we need to see you right back here recharged so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Make it an amazing weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday. Bye-bye.